You know, one thing about, as the world, there's a bunch of chaos, there's uh, people are just giving up, desperate and all that. We can come into sanctuary like this and just receive the calmness and the peace of God. Amen. And it's easy to forget, you know, that uh, we're, as children of God, we're, we house. That's an amazing thing. It still amazes me. We house the Holy Spirit. So where does the Holy Spirit dwell in us? And, and see, and the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. So that means that our spirits are the Holy of Holies. Because that's where the Ark, that's where the Holy Spirit is. Amen. You know, ministers, evangelists, missionaries, I've always had a really close, special heart for missionaries. I call them uh, Green Berets, willing to go where no man would wants to go. Got to have a call to be able to reach the lost, to reach the unreachable. And that it's, it's, the call brings the anointing. But also, as Brother Ronnie begins to spend some time with God, he goes to the post office of God. And so he's, he's going to deliver the mail. And it's a blessing for us to be here so that we can receive what, brought, what comes from the Lord. And it's a special call. And it's a special word. And one thing that's important that when you hear a word and you, re, re, you receive something, you have revelation. When, when there's revelation, you know it's, it went into your spirit. No revelation is in your mind. And before you get home, you probably forget over 50% of it. But when it's a revelation, it changes your life. Amen. Amen. Kind of like when Peter said, uh, Jesus asked him, who do you say that I, that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You think, you think Peter uh, would, would uh, forgot that? No. But in the same, th same time, isn't it amazing how us humans, we can lose what we get so quick? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon. For flesh and blood did not re uh, reveal it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. I can imagine Peter looking at the disciples and did you hear that? Yes. You, know? you know, he said it to me, you know. But in the same time, when he sustained that, he said the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, be you know, uh, be crucified, and the third day is going to rise. And then all of a sudden, he gets, Peter gets him out from the other disciples. And the Bible says he rebuked Jesus. See, I, asked, I was asking the Lord, how, how can I tell people when they're deceived? You see, one thing, about, <laughs> one thing about a deceiving spirit is that it's deceiving. You wouldn't know that you're deceived. So through Peter... The Lord revealed to me about what, what happens, what are the steps so that you can find out whether you're deceived or not. Okay, what did Peter do? Jesus said, deliver something that is going to be true. Nothing can stop it. But he wanted it to stop it. He rebuked Jesus. Now, a student rebuking the teacher. So in other words, a rebuking means that you know more than who you're going to rebuke. You see? So in other words, when a, when a, a member of a congregation uh, tries to correct the pastor, see, that, that's a deceiving spirit. See, you know, there's a difference between a question and a question. When you have a question because you didn't understand, the pastor would more, more than gladly to explain. But a question, questioning the authority of the pastor, you're being deceived. See, you know. And, see, and so what happens, from if, you're received, if you're deceived, you will not hear. See, you will not receive anything from, from the minister or your teacher. See, see you know, so, but in the, what did Jesus say when they asked him in Matthew 24? They said, what are the signs? You know, in all the, all the Gospels, what are the signs of your coming? And Jesus said, don't let anyone deceive you. So you know what that means? It was the last greatest attack in which you see, we're seeing it right now, is deception. deception. And any thought that does not align with what, the Word of God is deception. And see, so it's good to, once in a while, you know, I, I'm excited because I get to sit down and be ministered to the same way. Amen. 
So without any further ado, let's all stand. We're going to receive Brother Ronnie Freeman. Glory to God. Take your liberty, brother. Bless you. Bless you. Amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a big hand of praise tonight. He's the one that's worthy. He's worthy of all of our praise. You can be seated if you would like. It's such a privilege to be back at Praise Center Church. It's always an honor to be here. We honor your pastors, Pastor Arthur and Pastor Peggy. Just a blessing to the kingdom of God. I know a blessing to you. Um, able to visit with Pastor Arthur today and just hear his heart for evangelism and missions. And we just give God praise for that. And I count it a high privilege to be here tonight. I'm going to get into a word that I believe the Lord has put in my heart. It's more than just a sermon. And when I come to this house, my heart is, what is the Lord saying to this house and to those who will be here? And so I want to relay that to you tonight. Real quickly, before I get into that, just a little bit of house cleaning. Um, the last time I was here, shortly after, we have once a year for Dream Nations. Some of you, most of you know, but some of you may not. That we lead that organization, which is a missions organization, in many parts of the world, several different continents, and um, have over 120 churches under our umbrella. And we just give God praise for all that. And then along with that, we moved from our home state of Arkansas. I still bleed red Razorback, and I have a Razorback in front yard in Texas now. And my neighbors love me for that. And so we moved there as we became the director of missions and evangelism, basically a pastor uh, to missionaries in a global ministries network. And so that's where we've been almost two years now. Well, we're having our conference, and shortly after we were here, uh, the last night of it, uh, I, be, I became, uh, I didn't know what was going on. Basically, when uh, we checked my blood pressure, it was stroke level, and um uh, so through that whole series of events, I spent, uh, uh, I'd never been in an ambulance, three different times in an ambulance. And in between the second and third time, I still went on a missions trip to Honduras. Thankfully, we had a big team, a good team, and I was able to rest some, but I still wasn't well. And um, so anyway, but I can testify to you tonight that the Lord has completely healed me. 100%. And maybe in a few moments, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I said all that to say that when we were here before, if you ordered a t-shirt or sweatshirt, and especially if you pay for it, through that ordeal, I lost time and I lost the order forms. I don't know what happened to them. I'm just being honest with you. This has never happened, and when I was in Arkansas, I had my secretary, who still does our finances, but she also was a buffer and a help if something like that happened. So I just want to apologize to those who we might have missed in that. We heard of a couple, and we've taken care of that. So if that happened to be you or any of the uh, Pray Center family that's going to watch this on YouTube, please let us know. You can go back to the table, let them know, hey, I'm... I ordered this shirt, I paid for this shirt, I didn't get this shirt. It's not my heart to ever do anything like that intentionally. So I just wanted to share my heart on that. And even if you ordered one and you didn't pay for it and you still want it, just go back there, let them know. And then we have some shirts back there and fresh order sheets. So I just wanted to share my heart because that's not the way we want to run things. And But sometimes things happen. Now, can I tell you the good part of that? So I had this event happen in my life, and I only share this because it leads right into what God is going to be speaking tonight. As I went through this ordeal, and didn't really, I didn't even have a doctor in Texas yet, and uh, through the process, uh, had a doctor, saw a cardiologist, they started preparing tests, went through some of the tests. They couldn't figure out what was going on because two out of the three times I was in the ambulance, it was stroke level. But the last time I was in a supermarket just getting back from Honduras 
And um, when I was there, I was there was a FedEx inside the supermarket, and so I was trying to send some things. And when I was there, I began to feel very ill, and it felt as if I, I maybe my sugar level was low. So I rushed, and you know, I said, "Hang on, let me get something." So I rushed and got a Coke and M and M's and started. Uh, you know, was going to down them, but as I went to pay for them, my card went into the reader, and I went to the ground. And so thankfully, a worker saw me there and caught me as I hit the ground, and, and then I came to, I was, and so my blood pressure was stroke level, but this time it bottomed out. And so, of course, the doctors were completely confused, and what is going on, high and then low. And through a few tests and then through a few canceled appointments, I became a very frustrated individual. I know you've never been there. And, you know, I just came to a place where it's like, Lord, I know you're the healer. I'm tired of messing with these people. They don't know what's going on. And as sure as I'm standing here, there was a revival that I was to go preach. I wasn't well yet. Physically, I knew that, and wisdom told me, don't do it, but I felt in my spirit that I needed to, and I traveled to another state. I was in a hotel room the night before the, the revival was to begin on that Sunday morning, and it was the very night of time change, so we know you fall forward, you move the hour, uh, or you fall back, you move the hour back. And at exactly, because our cell phones do it for us now, right? At exactly 1 a.m., the Lord woke me up. I looked at my phone, and it read 1 a.m. I got up, went to the restroom, came back. It read 2 a.m., 2.01, whatever, as long as it took. So when I looked at the clock and I saw the time change, this is what the Lord said. Every hour the enemy, or wait, it said it went back. So it was 3 a.m. and it went back to 2 a.m. He said, every hour the enemy has stolen from you, I'm giving you back. He said, Ronnie, it is over. I shot up out of that bed. I began to worship the Lord. And before I knew it, I was on my face laughing in the Holy Spirit. If you've never experienced that, it's biblical. I began to laugh in the Spirit. Basically, it's the Lord bringing laughter and joy and healing to our heart. I'm telling you, from that moment, I spent four hours in the presence of the Lord. Pastor Arthur, I didn't do anything. I just simply stepped out in obedience and said, you know what? I probably shouldn't be going do, doing this revival. And my wife was certainly saying, you probably shouldn't be going do this revival. But I'm like, honey, I know the Lord has spoken to me. I don't know what he's going to do. And in that moment, at the exact time of time change, he woke me up before it changed. And then I watched it fall back. And the Lord said, I'm giving you every hour back. And I'm making the enemy pay back everything that he's stolen from you in this time. The only thing I didn't find is t-shirt and sweatshirt orders, but besides that, I got back, and when I got there on that Sunday morning, I preached like a wild man, and that revival was one of the greatest revivals that I'd ever preached. The pastor wanted to extend. Unfortunately, I had situations where I already was committed and couldn't go out of those commitments, and that church actually is still in a revival. A friend of mine is preaching there now. They're extending their meetings, I'm telling you that no matter what the enemy throws against your life and no matter what he has thrown, because I'm speaking to some people both here in this building who will watch and are watching on YouTube, you've been going through some things where the enemy has brought a great onslaught against your life, but it's not over. God is not finished. He is bringing you out. He is bringing you through. He will turn the sword of the enemy against himself and and he will bring you through it stronger, better, more equipped, and ready. Those next 
Those next mission trips that I went on, when I was in Honduras, I wasn't well. I was leaning on the team. But when I went to Kenya, there was a fire. I saw God do things like I'd never seen him do before. In a village that we went into, the, the, the pastors were separated. They were not together. And, and for the first time, they told me, we have had a uh, pastors and leaders conference where they brought the leaders together. They brought their church members on part of that. And 12 different churches came together in that little village area. The place was packed out. We saw pastors who did not even believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit come to the altar and have the Holy Spirit come upon them. They said, we have never seen something like this before. Please come back. We'll go to the city square and we'll put on a crusade because the Lord has anointed you and appointed you. I give Jesus all the glory because the devil was about to try to kill me, but he kept Jesus, kept me alive for greater things. And I tell you, the greater is coming in your life. The greater is coming to your family. The greater is coming to praise Center Church. The greater is coming to Visalia. The greater is coming to Sydney. California. God is not finished, though the enemy has fought tooth and nail, and he's tried to take God's people out, and especially God's generals, and those who will show up on Wednesday night, and those who will show up and pray, and those who will show up and support their leaders and their pastors, those who are praying for lost loved ones, those who are praying for your, your city and your area. The enemy targets you. He does not want you, not only to be saved and set on the pew but those who show up and say here I am captain of the Lord's host I am present and I am ready the enemy will target your life because of that but he loses as long as you will reach up to the hand of God every time the enemy comes along to knock you down hallelujah just slap your neighbor and tell him tonight is your night to get up Tonight, yes, some of you took well advantage of that permission. <laughs> Tonight is your night to get up. You know, even Paul, even Paul, the man who wrote more books of the Bible than any other man, he writes about his struggles. So struggles do not mean that we're in the wrong. Struggles do not mean that we're off track. Most of the time, it means the opposite. Sure, there are things that we go through and there are things that we face because we get off track and God will use those things. But most of the time, it is because we are going in the right direction. And in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul begins to write in verse 8, and there may be a, a, a few of you that talk about me if I don't read from the Bible, so I'm going to make sure you don't have that chance. I'm just teasing. Second Corinthians 4, verse 8. And you've heard this in the New King James, King James, so I'm going to read it from the Amplified, if that's okay. Verse 8 reads this way. We are pressured in every way but not crushed. Pressure comes, but it doesn't mean that Ronnie has to be crushed. Perplexed. Now here's the key word. This is a word that I believe the Lord wanted to drive home for you tonight. In the Amplified Version, of course, it's breaking down the original giving explanation, and we don't go around most of us in our everyday language using the word perplex. But here in the Amplified Version, in parentheses, it says, unsure of finding a way out. But not driven to despair. We we'll go ahead and read verse 9, but we're going to come back to verse 8. Verse 9, he says, hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted, alone. Struck down, but never destroyed. 
the enemy comes along to put pressure and there is a spiritual push to push us down. And there are people in this room in some level or another are down, but God is reaching his hand toward you and he says it's time to get up. It is time for you as an individual. It is time for you as a minister because we are all ministers. We are all called. It is time for you as a believer. It is time for you who have been on the front lines. It is time for some people in this room that were on the front lines, but there has been damaging onslaught from the enemy for you to simply reach up and take the hand that is already reaching down to you because you cannot earn or deserve that. You can't work for that. You can't pray enough, do enough. It's about who he is and who you are. You are not not slaves. You are not even servants. You are sons and daughters of the king. And sons and daughters have a place at the table. You have a place, a special place in the heart of the father. And he's always reaching down his hand at you. He doesn't look at you. Now you're down. I'm going to turn my back on you because you're not worth a whole lot to me. Nope. Even when you're down, he says nothing changes about the way I feel about you. In fact, he says my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Often when we are weak, especially us pulpit preachers, so to speak, five-fold ministers, we want to hide. We don't want anybody to see our weakness. We don't want anybody to know. And so is it often in the church, maybe with leaders leadership, maybe with people that are stepping and have stepped in the front line, or just people in general within the body of Christ. We want to hide. We don't want anybody to know I'm weak. I'm struggling. But come on, church, it's time for us to be open and real. It Don't hide your struggle. Bring it to the forefront. Bring it into the light. When you bring it into the light, then his strength is able to be made perfect in your weakness. In other words, when you're down, he gets closer. When you're down, he gets in your shoes. Do you understand? When you say, well, nobody can walk in my shoe. Nobody else walks in my shoes. That is only halfway true, which is all the way a lie. Because here's the thing. No other human being can walk in your shoes, but the king of glory, whose name is Jesus, is always walking with you in your shoes. He's not the God who just walks beside me, in front of me, behind me. He's the God who is in me me and walking with me in me. He is in my shoes. Nobody else knows about where my shoes are carrying me, but he does. He always does. And he doesn't come out of my shoes when I'm down and out and going through struggles and I'm going through tribulation and I need to get back up but I can look up to him and take his hand and there is something supernatural that God will do when he lifts. He's in this room to lift somebody. Somebody you came tonight not knowing exactly what God was going to do in your life but I've just come to prophesy and declare to you this is a night for you to be lifted up, lifted up above the darkness, lifted up above the damaging and the damning thoughts of hell that seem to just press on you and push you and lie to you. And for some of you, this is the image that I see in my spirit. It's like from the backside, the enemy's just been pushing downward and pushing downward to push you down. But the Lord says, enough is enough. I am here to break that thing to cause him to get his hands off of you pushing against you so that you can turn to him in the name of my son Jesus and his own sword be turned against him and your enemies flee many different directions and you go to the next level as an individual as a family and as praise centered church because this is the hour of the great endeavoring of a harvest and the Lord wants his people to rise up and be present to the captain of the Lord's host and say where is my place where are you calling me and we've all been called to that calling of prayer to pray in this harvest and this last great awakening hallelujah and so Paul says hey I mean he's doing the work of the Lord this man 
it, you read the New Testament, and so in writing his epistles to the different churches that God has been using him to plant all over the known world. So he has all these accolades and all of these great and mighty things that God has used him in. And yet he says, we are perplexed. We're pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. And then in verse 9, he's talking about the battle. The key one for us tonight, perplexed. And I read to you in the Amplified Version, we do not know the way out. Perplexed, puzzled. So what the word mean? Puzzled. So he says, we are puzzled. So you have this man who wrote more books of the Bible than any other man, plants churches all over the known world, an incredible apostle of God, overseeing churches, and yet he's perplexed. He says, we are facing things, myself and those traveling and working with me, we are facing things that we do not have the answer for. And this is what the Lord put in my spirit. He said, Ronnie, many of my people have entered a season in which they have experienced being perplexed. There are some years back, and I want you to hear this. There are some years back when not just myself, but many others begin to talk about how a third great awakening was coming to America. And we are seeing, there are pockets and places, and I mentioned this before, even here in this place, where God is doing it. We're seeing and hearing what is going on on college campuses, universities. And you can bet you the news is not going to tell the whole story about that. They're not going to tell the story about the students in the secular campus where God moves sovereignly and they're repenting. They're repenting to each other. They're sobbing. They're crying. And then they start having church in a room and they kick them out. And then they start having church on the lawn of the, the university. And then they kick them out so you can't have church on the lawn. So in the road that runs right down in the middle of the university, they got their worship music out. They're worshiping, praising, repenting, being saved, being baptized. They said, we'll just do it in the road if we can't use a bill. Come on somebody don't give up on generation x god has a remnant he's raising up some young people and young adults god is on the move but what we have seen has just scratched the surface and this is what the lord put in my heart he said ronnie as others yourself many of my people have begun to talk about a third great awakening hitting america that brings a, a, a in gathering of a billion soul plus harvest worldwide. As that word begin to go forth, the enemy knows his time is limited. We don't know the hour of the day that he's coming, but the enemy has worked overtime to crush, to perplex, to push down the people of God so that our soul becomes broken. Now I'm getting to the meat of this. Just tell your neighbor, it's time for some meat. Come on, tell your neighbor. Time some for the meat of the word. And some of you are in the fellowship hall and like, I already has some meat. <laughs> and so as Paul is perplexed, he said, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're puzzled, and we do not have the answer for what we are facing. And I know that in this room there are people that are there. And I have been there. And there are people watching that are there. And the Lord would say to you, you may not have the natural answers to that thing that perplex you. But he reminds you that he is the answer every time. And because he is the answer every time, he has the specific answers of your perplexing situation. So in due time, from point A, when you let him restore your broken soul, your circumstance for some may not change, but you change. So that now you see what you are perplexed about different. 
you see it fully temporary. But sometimes when we're perplexed, we're puzzled, we don't know the way out. That's the way the Amplified explained it. We do not know. We don't know how to solve this. I don't know. Am I preaching the right church? Does anybody? We don't know the answer to this. We didn't we can't figure out the puzzle. You know, I've always tried to figure out people that like puzzles. <laughs> if you do, no offense. I'm just like intrigued by your mind. Wow, how's that work? You know, I'm just going to tell you, buy me a 5,000-piece puzzle. I love you, but I'm going to re-gift it. <laughs> I mean, that drive, that's like, wow, too much patience right there. Talking about perplexing. Give me a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Anxiety. And so it's like a puzzle. You know, people who tell me, you know, they like puzzles and they do puzzles. They, from what I understand, try to get the outside border pieces. But it's in those inner pieces that's hard to determine who, where they are and how they go. And so sometimes we've got the border and we've got some parts of things figured out. But in the midst of that puzzle, we don't know the inners. We don't know the, the intricacies. We don't know the details. We're not sure what to do about that kid, that child of ours that is acting like a crazy person. We don't know what to do about those grandkids that are, that, that are, that are, that are running from God and doing things that we never dreamed possible. We don't know how it happened when our marriage fell apart. We don't know how it happened when our body became sick. We don't understand how to deal with the, a situation that seems so complicated. We've all been there, and some of you are there tonight. And God says, I see that you are puzzled, and I see that you do not know the way out. But he says, tonight, I will breathe a second wind into your spirit, into your soul. I specifically am talking to the soul. I said the word spirit, but I mean soul, because the the we have the body, so we understand he'll attack there, and I believe for healing tonight. But then we have the spirit that has been born again and been saved. But in between there, we have the soul. We have the mind, the will, and the emotions. And there are those of you, your soul has been greatly attacked by hell. And what God says, I want to give you a second for a third. I want to give you a second win for a third great awakening. Because I want you to still be on the front lines. I want you to be smack dabs still in the middle of things when I unleash this third great awakening on America that goes to the entire world that brings in that billion soul plus harvest. So this is not time to stay down. This is not time to stay overwhelmed by not having the pieces to the puzzle. But instead, it's time to reach up so he can pull you up and help you get up and get back with it. And even though some things will happen instantly, there will be other things that you will still not know the intricate details and you will not know where to put the pieces of the puzzle, but you will have a strength in your soul because God breathed into your soul a second wind. I'm telling you tonight, a second wind is coming to somebody in this room that would be open enough to say, God, my soul needs restored. So I'm opening my soul to you and letting you do it. Hallelujah. My goodness, I just looked at the clock. What happened? So let me hurry with this thing. I told you the physical thing and it just so happens it was another hotel room, another time preaching the next day. And this is some time back. And as I was just meditating on the Lord, and I was, I just laid on the bed, and I was just listening. Sometimes we, we should pray and talk, but sometimes it's good to stop and listen, right? Don't forget to stop and listen. Because he's talking. So, Pastor, I just had a moment I was listening and I heard the Lord just put in my spirit. 
Ronnie, I want to restore your soul. And you know, in that moment, certainly you can't argue with God. Well, you can, but you'll lose every time. But I knew what he was saying. I knew back then, through a period of time, that there had been much pushing, much battle. Because we go through it too, right? All of us. Your pastors go through it. You go through it. We all do. And so me and my, you know, man of faith and power, I'm like, okay, God, that sounds great. I'll pray. In fact, I'll pray in the Spirit. And then I heard the whisper, you just be quiet and lay here. (laughs) Yes, sir. And as sure as I'm standing here tonight, it was like heaven. It was like the hand of God was put over my belly. It was like something hit me in my belly. Now, before you get nervous, tonight when we have prayer time, I'm not going to come around and hit you in your belly. Okay? I promise. It's a spiritual thing. John 7, 37 through 39. Jesus is at the feast. And he's kind of like Jeremiah who writes and says, the word is like a fire shut up in my bones. He had been at this feast and the word of the Lord was so burning that finally he stands up at the feast. And he said, behold, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. In verse 38, he says, and out of his belly, this is where your soul is, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then the Holy Spirit went on to pen through John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the explanation. And he says, this spake he of the Holy Spirit who was not yet given because he had not yet been glorified. We understand you celebrated Resurrection Day a few Sundays ago, some weeks back, and so we understand that he died, he rose again, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He has been glorified, which means verse 39, no longer it has been fulfilled. So the Holy Spirit has been given. So what is he saying now? If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Now listen, there are people in this room who have done that and then there are people in this room who need to do that. Maybe for the first time, go deeper with God, get in closer, press in. But I'm especially speaking to people whether you've never done it, you've done it, many of you have. God wants to do it again because he says tonight, not Ronnie, he says, I see that your soul is broken, that your mind has been bombarded by the thoughts of hell and your mind has been running rampant watch this three parts of the soul then there is your will in your will there is not only we understand we have a free will to choose but part of that choosing is not just to do right or wrong but it's choosing the ability to choose to still fight to still dream to still go for what God put in our heart for the very first time there is that will to say no when I was 18 years old and God just messed me up and I laid myself on an altar and I said, whatever you want to use me to do. And then as you sometimes have to be careful for God to do, he shows me the entire continent of Africa. And he says, I've called you to reach the entire continent. And so I just say, okay, I'm here on the altar. But in those temptation times when the soul is being bombarded and there are perplexing situations, there is the temptation to go back and get Ronnie up off the altar and say, God, it's just too much. Behind every door is a bigger devil. Every time I step into a new nation, there are new devils. Every time things grow in a nation, and I give God praise for all this. And so since I've been with you, 
you. We've been back to Malawi, Africa, and we saw over 30,000 people attend the crusade, and over 20,000 people were saved. And I can promise you, there's only one star, and his name is Jesus. And I'm a nobody who came from nowhere without him, but now I'm no longer a nobody. I'm somebody, a son of God. You're a daughter of God in him, but he's the one who always does it. So the temptation is to pick ourselves back up off that altar and say it's just too much. And so the soul, the mind, the will to fight, the emotions, the emotions begin to run all over the place. Fear, worry, anxiety, stress. And I'm I'm giving you the quick and short version of this. But I want to tell you, That when God supernaturally, without anybody else touching me, put his hand on my belly. As Romans 8.26 says, and when we know not how to pray, the Spirit will pray through us with groanings, King James Version. Others say noises. And it says words cannot compare. When he put his hand on my belly, there were groanings. If somebody would have just walked into that hospital room, they would have thought, man, this guy is nuts. It's a spiritual thing. But I am telling you, when he was done, my soul was restored. And so you know the psalm, and I'm closing with this. Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. And then in verse 5, he says, and he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So I just got to get this. I I usually get three, but because I'm out of time, I'm only going to have two closings. So there's a table Spread and waiting for you tonight. In the presence of your enemy, but I want you to see this. The enemy may be present. He's the one who has fought your soul. I'm telling you, there are people in this room that your soul is broken, but he's the healer and restorer. He's the God who restores, not destroys. And he says tonight, enough is enough. I'm going to repair and restore your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions. And then you cultivate it on a daily basis by being in his word, by spending time with him. Listen, here's what I do. Cultivate it. Hand, put it on my belly. Touch my soul today, Lord. You cultivate it. Apply it every day. But he's going to initiate and spark something tonight that is supernatural. It's not physical. I'm doing the best I can with my my English language to describe it to you. So he prepares this table. It's in the presence of the enemy, but watch this. At the table, you have a chair. And your chair... Your name has been carved in blood in your chair. And I am telling you, your table that's in the presence of your enemy, he may be present, he may be nearby, but he can't get too close. He certainly can't take your chair. He certainly can't sit in your chair. In fact, there is nobody on planet earth that can sit in your chair but you. Your chair was made for you. It has your name on it. Your name is carved in the blood of Jesus. He gave his blood. He did it all so you could be son and daughter and take your place in the king's palace and at the king's table. I don't have time, but Mephibosheth, who was wrong family and crippled Saul's family, Saul's grant, shouldn't have even, but God caused David 
to remember. And the king has remembered you. And when Mephibosheth, who shouldn't even be in the palace, and he's crippled, in that day, if you study the king's table, the toppings, the, the, the cloths, the things they put over the table were very elegant and very large. They hung down low, is what I'm trying to say. And so Mephibosheth's nanny had dropped him when he was a baby running for his life trying to save him. And so his feet were crippled. But every time he went into the palace and every time he took the table, took the chair with his name on it, and they scooted him up under the table, his crippleness was covered. I've been covered. I have been weak. But I have been covered. And now I can join those who say, let the weak say I am strong. So there's a chair tonight with your name on it. Devil can't take it. Nobody else can sit in it. Will you? Because I'm telling you tonight as you take your chair, he's going to restore your soul. Would you stand with me all over the room tonight? Come on, give Jesus a big hand for his truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and whatever we do for prayer and music, and if, if someone uh, can just slide the table uh, out of the way, I'd appreciate it. Father, we love you tonight, and we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that you are a God who helps pick us up and who helps and who restores our soul. Lord, I've never seen an hour like it when there are so many outside the body, but also within the side the body of Christ whose soul has been so battled. And many who love you and many who are still serving and doing things, even as I was that night, some time back, and you just spoke right where I was at. So as I'm being transparent, Lord, it's, it's, we're, none of us are exempt. We need it. And Lord, if there happens to be one here who doesn't know you or they're watching, though I've mainly talked to believers, I pray that you would show them the only way is you to heaven for their spirit to be born and brought to life. And then they're hurting too. You are the healer of those hurts. Satan, I rebuke you in every lie and hindrance. And everything that you would try to do in the mind of the people hearing me, both online and listening, in person, to complicate the simplicity of this word. I loose understanding. I release the supernatural work of the Spirit to cause the word to penetrate beyond the mind into the heart and the spirit of every person in this room and listening. An openness to come to the table. So as your heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here, you don't know the Lord or your prodigal, you're one other way or you're watching. You can pray right there at home. And if you're here, I want you to come when others come. But from all over this room, and listen, there's several of you in this room. And I will say that because I'm looking for something to do. I say that because I know it in my spirit. And so if you're in this room and you would say, I need the Lord to touch my soul. Or if you're in this room and you would say, it is true, I'm perplexed. I don't have the way out. I don't have the answers. And some of you, it's both those things. 
So if that's you from all over the room, would you just slip out of your seat? And if you're physically able, just come and stand across the face stage. And we're just going to have a prayer with you. And I'm telling you, the Lord is here to do incredible things. Just keep coming. You're not going to be by yourself. Several are already coming. If you're physically unable to stand, I don't want to leave you out. So please come have a seat on the front seats if you're not able to stand. That's it. That's it. Come on, men, women of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are beautiful, Lord. You restore my soul. You restore the soul. That's it. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. We have plenty of people to pray for, and we're going to begin to do that. I just sense in my heart there's some of you just contemplating what God's been speaking. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. I just want to invite, of course, our pastors, leaders, Church members, church uh, pray center, your sins are in the blood. You're free from oppression. Just come and join me. And we're going to begin to pray for these. Those of you who have come, I don't want you to rush off. We're just going to move as the Holy Spirit leads us and pray for you. You don't have to wait for me to receive or someone else. God may do it without anybody getting to you. And then as we're praying for these, if some of you have held back, you're welcome to get in here. So we're just going to begin to take our liberty. The rest of the leadership, you just take your liberty however you feel led. Mm. So make sure I have at least one woman, one man helping me. And you can turn that up just a hair, not too loud, just a hair. I just want you to know, church, there's no strain. There's a freedom right here. Because this is what God is doing in this hour. He's restoring the soul of God's people so they're ready for what's coming. A great move of the Holy Spirit. beautiful to watch the joy of the Lord hit people. Thank you, Jesus.
Pastor! You're waiting on prayer. Just keep going. Those of you to my right, we're coming back that direction. If you need this and you're not up here, I'm telling you there's a liberty. Those waiting in the chairs, we're going to be praying for you. If you have to leave, we understand. Feel free to talk, stop by the table. It's been a privilege to be with you.
isso, Lord. Isso, isso. Those waiting, we're still praying. Just hang in there. deeper places, oh God. No one else can get to you, Jesus. <laughs> Even the babe in the womb, Lord, can feel the flow of your Holy Spirit. Open that ground. Open that ground.
name of Jesus. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Restore. Restore. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Yeto na na mahato ba? Ele mato ba? Santa da 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 ba? Ina mahato ba? Awake, lift, and restore in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 
tonight that you restore and you prove that it's a truth, it's a peace, it's a renewal to be able to keep moving toward the things that when your time is there, circumstances are there, this thing that you think is the enemy that you can't get away from, that you're defeated by the mighty God. Go! Cool. 
Father, you take your hand and reach into her soul and restore every part and lift in the name of
Restore. Restore. In the name of Jesus. Lift. Lift. Rebuke the root of hoop pain. I bind you up and command you to go where the keys of the kingdom of heaven may be given to me. And with the same keys, I will lose the virtue of Jesus. Lord, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, Lord, loose your healing keys in her feet. Take your big bucket of oil, pour over her head. Now, heal in your feet in the name of Jesus. You restore. And Lord, even greater than her feet, touch her soul tonight. Her mind. Command all confusion. Break in every part. Every part. You know the detail. We as men may not know. Doctors may not know. But you know. She may not know puzzle to her. How do I fix this? It is beyond her fixing, but not yours. Restore clarity for the mind. Remove the fog. Remove every mind trap of hell. In the name of Jesus. Every mind trap of the enemy break. Nightmares, night terrors. Go. Enemy, 
you are a terrorist. Get, quit terrorizing this woman's mind. Go! You've terrorized her mind long enough. Enough is enough. Break by the blood of Jesus. Restore the mind of this woman right now, Lord. You've heard her cry. And you answer her. And Lord, I thank you. It's not about just getting rid of thoughts. It's replacing them with the thoughts of the word. She is a victor, not a victim. A conqueror, not a conqueror. What he is conquered. She's above and not beneath. She is daughter of God. She has a seat at the table. What is she doing? So all these lies of the enemy. Not just about getting rid of them, yes, but it's replacing with truth. So I just pray, Lord, you've set her on a journey tonight to help her church, her pastors and leaders in replacing those thoughts. But it begins tonight with you, as you're speaking, Lord, through this, us praying for her and your voice. Just listen to her voice. Listen to the Lord. Command the enemy to hush. Remove every lie. Go, go, go. You have no permission, even from the outside, to penetrate her mind. Now stop. She walls her mind in with the blood. And we draw that bloodline, and I declare a space only around her mind for truth to now come in. Come in. Come in, truth, like a flood. Flow, flow about who she is in you, who you are to her. You are Abba, Daddy, Daddy, loving Father. Greater. Beautiful Jesus. Ah. Outpour, Holy Spirit, outpour.
do these things, release the river out of her belly that flows freely up out of her belly and even out of her mouth in prayer language. Now, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. floodgate, Lord. Fresh. Brand new. I just want to give this back to Pastor. Thank you for staying with us. I just wanted to mention that I, I am so thankful for Pray Center. And some of you may be aware, Eric and the outreach team, Max, and I believe some of the youth are joining us in a home missions work right here in Central California in Pixley. Pixley, many of you know, or may not know, but I've been there preaching in a church for several years. And the Lord just sparked something in my heart. And he said, you're doing missions all over the world. <laughs> California needs missions. <laughs> so we're going outside the church. On Friday, we're hitting the whole city. And Pray Center has been a driving force to prepare this even before we could get here. And I, I just thank you, pastors, for giving that blessing. And, and for, for Eric, thank you so much. Amen. In the back, we're not going to come back and receive just on the on your way out. You know, it's amazing how. Real, real quick, and you know, you got to understand I'm a preacher. <laughs> so many people do not want to cross trouble. And you may ask, why did, for example, Paul, why did Paul have so much problems? Either he had a revival or riot everywhere he went. And the reason why is for the great revelation. He went to the third heaven. One time they were stoned in him, they left for dead, he did die. And he went to the very presence of God, and he got revelations that he has never given to any God, had never given to any man. 
This is why he wrote, thank God, for one-third of the New Testament. He wrote, he, God, revelation that the, the, even the apostles, his disciples, did not know. And see, so he, he says it gives it a, because of the revelation, it was given to me a Satan, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest any, lest I should be exalted above measure. One time, a few years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, son, do you have a brain? It's funny. I said, uh, yes. Where is your brain? See, he's a, he has a way to get you to what he wants you to, to hear. I said, on, on my head. Where is your head in comparison to your body, the very top of your body, of my body? I said, yes. When you allow p problems, pressure, jealousy, offense in your, in your mind, you, you are elevating it to the highest part of your life. What's worse than that, I hear, is that you elevated it into your mind and you put that between you and I. This is why you're not able to hear me. Paul says he pleaded with, with God three times. And the New Living Translation says, and every time the Lord spoke. Three times when the Lord, uh, Saul, Paul only heard once. Why? It is because he was too preoccupied with the, with the thorn in the flesh. If we are so preoccupied with the problems in our minds and all that, we will not be able to hear the voice of the Lord. That's why the problems linger, you see, you know. But we need, we need to take control and to know, cast all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you, First, First Peter 5, 7. And see, so, and then he, he was complaining. Can you imagine Paul was complaining? I, I begged, there's another translation, I begged God three times. But I love what the New Living Translation says. And every time God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then all of a sudden, his complaint turned into praise. He says, I therefore most gladly, I uh, therefore most gladly, I would rather boast of my infirmities lest the, that the power of God may rest upon me. Therefore, notice here, I take pleasure. The, the Amplified Bible says, says, I take great pleasure. You know what pleasure is, right? When you're eating pralines and cream, that's pleasure, man. You know, see? And so, he said, therefore, I take great pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions. The Amplified Bible says, and insults. Can you imagine? It, he took, it took great pleasure when somebody insulted him. And he pretty much, every time he went out, he was insulted. Now, Paul went through that. And how did he saw, see the problems? It says in, in the, the uh, scripture that uh, uh, Ronnie preached on, on uh, 2 Corinthians 4, is, you know, he says, not, our great, he said, our light affliction. He didn't have light affliction, but that's the way he saw it. Our light affliction is working for us, a far more exceeding weight of glory. Isn't it amazing? The, the, the conflict, the problems, if we allow it through the grace of God to fight for us, then that problems and negative stuff can weigh, put weight on our glory before the Lord. Isn't it amazing? Turn, in other words, God is going to turn it around. We, we don't have to. God will. And so when the Lord spoke to me, he says, when you, when you fight in faith, you are allowing me to fight your battles. So many times the reason why God cannot fight our battles is because we think we can try, we can do them. No, no, we can't. We can't. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, brother. That's awesome. This is, the, you're, you got the second win. What are you going to do about it? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that second wind, you'll be able, it's strong enough to blow Satan away out of you, out, out of your circumstances, out of your problems, and out of your children, especially the stubborn ones, the donkey ones. Amen. You blow, blow that stubbornness away in the name of Jesus. Amen. And it'll work. Why? Because God is on your side. Heaven is on your side. There's nothing, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. No weapon. And everything that raises up against you, you shall condemn. If you have a rebellious child, condemn it. 
Not the child. The spirit. Amen. I can make it, I'm going to make that clear. Not the child. The, the spirit. In the name of Jesus, I command you com- that uh, spirit of, uh, of rebellion out of my child in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Boy, you left it kind of warm up here. You know, <laughs> let's all stand. We're going to pray. And, and I received the blessing. I, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his precious face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his grace and his peace. And may the spirit of the Lord guide you in all your decision making this week. And when you follow God, follow according to what Proverbs 3 says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he's going to direct your path. You will be successful. No, no, you won't be successful. You are successful. You'll keep that success by listening to the Holy Spirit. Amen? God bless you all. Amen.